Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Klang. I have a company in Atlanta called Mojo Lingo. We build voice applications that work like magic. And I'm going to talk to you today about, I'm also actually the leader of the Adhesion Project, and I'll explain what that is in just a second. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about call control power tools with Adhesion. So before I get started, how many of you, how many of you in here have heard of Adhesion? Awesome. OK. It gets bigger every year. I love that. Um, and how many of you have tried it? OK, cool. Um, how many of you have tried to build something in Asterisk and been frustrated with the syntax of extensions.com? Really? I thought it'd be everybody, but OK. Um, first, let me talk a little bit about what Adhesion is. Jay Phillips, the guy who originally wrote, uh, who created the Adhesion project, called it Adhesion that you can hear. He, he, taught, he considers it gluing the voice layer, in this case Asterisk, to the rest of the world. Voice application development framework. Um, you guys in here probably have heard of things like Ruby on Rails or Cake PHP or Zen Framework. These are all frameworks for uh, building web applications. They get rid of the annoying stuff that you have to do on every web application uh, and let you focus on what you're actually trying to build, you know, maybe what's called a business logic. So adhesion is the same thing for voice, for voice applications. You get to focus on actually doing whatever it is you're trying to do. And then it is, of course, open source and written in Ruby. Uh, if you have an existing Rails application, Adhesion can seamlessly integrate with that Rails application. So for those of you who might know Rails, you get to load all of the active record models, whatever helpers you may have defined. Um, so it does integrate nicely, but it is not dependent. We have, we have a lot of installations where Adhesion stands alone and just provides the, uh, the voice application service. It's platform agnostic, thanks to Ruby. It can run anywhere that Ruby runs. And actually, because one of the uh, leading Ruby interpreters is actually built on the JVM, it'll run anywhere the JVM runs. So this means Windows, Linux, Mac, Solaris, just about anything. Very, very portable. It has a fairly small footprint. We keep uh, most of the complexity at the telephony layer. So typically what we'll have is um, the asterisk instance or whatever the, is providing the voice service will bottleneck before Adhesion will. We've seen, we have many applications that scale up to hundreds of concurrent calls. And uh, Adhesion's still not breaking a sweat. And it's cloud ready, which is sort of buzzwordy, so I threw it in there. But it, uh, we actually do, you can deploy it. Here's an applications to the cloud. You can also use cloud-based telephony services like Tropo to, uh, to process your calls. So I'm, I'm realizing I'm in a room at a telephony conference. I'm going to tell you some of the things you can do with it. Here's, and this is probably going to be really basic for you all. But call center workflow optimization, so doing things like making sure your agents have the information they need from third-party systems, or making sure that third-party systems have information from the agents. Uh, the same is true for Salesforce automation, so getting information into and out of the CRM. Conferencing applications, getting, uh, being able to set them up through a web interface and then allow users to log in through the phone system. Another, an example of that is actually a translation service. We, ha we actually helped a client build where they connect callers to translators to help them provide that service. And all the uh, selection algorithms for figuring out which translators are available and in which languages is all handled in Adhesion. Obviously, things like IVR, those, uh, those interactive voice response menus. Polling, so anytime uh, we, we did a project with a political candidate who wanted to be able to send, uh, send polls out and ask questions of his constituency. Um, these things are really easy to build with you know, something like Ruby, whereas they're maybe not so easy to build with something like uh, extensions.com. And robocalling, so maybe your, uh, your pharmacy calls you, lets you know your, your medication is ready or your dentist reminds you of an appointment coming up. So this is the bread and butter of adhesion, right? These are, the, these are the basic things that most telephony applications need to do. I mean, there's more than this list, but this is a good start. But there's other stuff you can do with adhesion. Epic scale public art displays. One of my favorite examples of this, and I've got a video, if I have time, I'll show you at the end. There was this enormous display at Mutech, which is an arts festival in Montreal, and they projected on the side of a building music staff, and then they had a phone number as well. So anyone who would call in would be assigned a portion of the music staff and would be able to, using just the keypad digits, enter notes into the staff. And the music was constantly playing. So as people participated in this experiment, the music would constantly be changing and evolving. And all of this was done using, uh, actually, the, the front end was as a flash through these giant projectors, and the back end was all asterisk and adhesion. It's really cool. Uh, it's sort of in the same vein, video games on billboards. Uh, companies, we've actually seen a company that actually made it so if you're standing in one of those billboards that has one of the electronic displays, like a television type display, it'll project 
the game onto the display and then you can call in and play. So multiple people standing around and whoever can see the billboard can actually participate in the same game. You can also fly helicopters with it. So this is something I did. Have, any, have you guys here heard of the AR drone? Uh -huh. Oh yes, okay. So for those of you who haven't, it's a four-bladed helicopter. It's about this big. And it is, uh, it's, it's remote controlled. Usually you fly it with an iPhone or an iPad. You tilt the iPad to control it, whatever. But what's cool about it is that the company that makes it, Parrot, they actually released all the specifications for talking to this drone. It's just a simple UDP protocol. So I wrote a library that sends the control packets to the drone. And it does things like tell it to tilt forward or tilt right, tilt left. And then I took that and wired it to Adhesion. So you can actually pick up an analog telephone and fly a helicopter. It's totally useless, but really cool. <laughs> um, biometric identity verification. This is something I've actually heard more and more, although this story goes back quite a bit further. Um, using voice print to, valid, to verify an identity of a person. We actually know of a deployment of adhesion in the green zone in Iraq, where they used, uh, used the application to validate the identities of people passing through the checkpoint. So there's, there's some pretty cool out-of-the-box ideas. Um, and war dialing. So <laughs> we have a conference for the Adhesion Project called Adhesion Conf. It was uh, about three weeks ago in San Francisco. And one of the guys that came up to present talked about, uh, he called it weaponizing the cloud, war dialing with Adhesion. And he actually built a war dialer. And it was, he said the original batch of 10,000 numbers on existing projects to do war dialing took something like 15 days to complete. And he did it in 28 minutes. Um, now. Caveat that, this is illegal, so don't do it. But you can. Um, so, and in his case, it actually wasn't illegal, but it is a, it's still a cool project. And the video from this will be online if you check the Adhesion website. So a little bit about the history of Adhesion. Our initial platform has always been, our home, our home turf has always been Asterisk. So Adhesion has supported Asterisk from, from day one when we did the first release in 2008. Um, actually, the project goes back to 2006, but I would call 2008 when we really reached maturity. And we have a very, very, very good support for both AGI and AMI, the two interface uh, connections into Asterisk. In 2010, Jason Gecki wrote a, actually it's an AGI emulation layer for Tropo. So if you're familiar with Tropo, it makes Tropo speak AGI. The great news for us is that means that any AGI script, including Adhesion, can be migrated to Tropo, and so you can run on either of those. In 2011, we partnered with Voxeo and also with uh, Blue Via, which is a division of Telefonica, to bring support to the Rayo protocol to Adhesion. So we can actually now take advantage of Prism, which is a enterprise grade, very large scale, something like 10,000 concurrent calls in a single instance platform. So with Adhesion, you can write your app on any of these platforms and migrate to any of the other platforms with little to no code change required. So a bit about the architecture of Adhesion. Obviously, at the top, you have to get the call in somewhere. That, uh, that telephony platform, the asterisk, the prism, or the tropa, will pass the call down into Adhesion, where we have full control over things like saying text to speech, or uh, collecting input from the keypad, or hanging up, or transferring, or whatever. But then we can import these external data sources, so things like SQL, uh, if you need to pull information out of a database, or LDAP, this would be true for Active Directory as well. Connecting also to XMPP and Jabber. So for example, and a kind of cool use case of this is anytime someone joins my company's conference bridge, it sends a notification into the chat room so we know when people uh, are joining in. That's nice because every so once in a while I might put the calendar event in the wrong place and I'll totally miss the notification. But I'll get this message saying that someone's on my conference bridge and I can go catch it. It may have saved me once or twice. The other cool thing though is that you can get presence information out. So if you want to make a routing decision based on whether a person is logged into instant messaging or maybe even whether they're available or away, you can access that using XMPP as well. Then of course anything web-based, anything that provides an API, you can connect. Uh, the, the common ones today are things like XML interfaces such as SOAP or XML RPC, uh, JSON interfaces. And uh, Ruby has excellent coverage for the for generic level implementation of all of those protocols. However, there are higher abstractions as well. So, for example, if you wanted to connect to YouTube or to Google, any of Google's APIs, there are gems, which are Ruby libraries that are publicly distributed, that will allow you to take advantage of all that functionality out of the box. You don't have to reinvent that wheel. So that's really a, a big advantage of using an actual a programming language as opposed to trying to do it all with uh, just extensions. So to kind of illustrate this point, I'm going to show you how it's an example database operation in Dialplan, 
and I'll do the same thing showing it to you in Adhesion's uh, dial plan. So first, and uh, is that big enough? Can you guys read that? I don't know that I can make it much bigger, but um, this is an extent, it's a very simple application. When the call comes in, it queries the database based on the caller ID, looks up the caller's name, which is assumed to be in the database, and then it uses Kepstrel, App Swift, to say hello, and whatever the name of the person is, and then it disconnects. So there are two, prob two, two big problems, anyway, with this. Uh, one is a performance problem, and one is a security problem. So I'm curious if anyone can tell me what either of those problems are. I'm sorry? This is using the MySQL add-on that, that comes with the asterisk code base. Was there a... The database password's in dial plan. I actually didn't consider that, but that is a very good point, that the password is actually in the dial plan. Yep, over here. Non-persistent session. Right, so every time a call comes in, you have a new database handle open, which means if you have 500 concurrent calls, you have 500 open database handles. That, which you may be able to get around a funk ODBC. Um, I'm actually not as familiar with that. But okay, so that, that's the performance issue I was thinking of. Does anyone see the security issue? Yes? What happens if they spoof their caller ID? There's no, there's no validation. There's a SQL injection here. With the PSTN, you may not have an issue, but with SIP, where, you, where your caller has control over the uh, caller ID, they could very easily change their caller ID to something that drops the tables out of your database. Little Bobby tables, XKCD fans, yes. And it's also, okay, so that also fixes it on ODBC. Um, but still, this is, this is, in my opinion, not ideal. Um, does does Funko DBC provide connection pooling? Anyway, um, okay, so let me show you what this looks like in Ruby with Adhesion. So first of all, you'll notice it's a lot less code, which is nice. Uh, the first line looks up the caller. So the caller with the capital C is a model that maps to an active record connection. So this is telling us to look at the callers table. And we want to find by caller ID, we're going to use the variable caller ID. Now in this case, um, because we're using the find by caller ID, it's actually going to escape everything for us. So we don't have to worry about uh, sanitizing the input at that layer. Also, the way we instantiate active record, we have a database pool. So when the adhesion process boots up, it makes however many connections uh, at the very beginning, it makes all those connections right up front, and then keeps those in a, in a stable of connections. So each time a call processes, it checks out a connection from the pool and does whatever query it needs and checks it back in. So your performance is much uh, more predictable. The other thing that's kind of nice about this is Adhesion provides a speak method. So instead of relying on App Swift, instead of having to, uh, so let's say down the road that you want to change from Kepstrel to NeoSpeech. Well, with the old example, you'd have to go through your extensions.conf and find every instance of Swift and change it to uh, UniMRCP, which is probably not a huge deal, but it's not really great either. With Adhesion, it's configuration. We use the speak method, which is a generic text-to-speech uh, method call, and it looks at the configuration within the Adhesion process and says, this server is configured to use Kepstrel, so it'll call App Swift. Or this server is configured for NeoSpeech and it'll use MRCP. Is it multilingual? So the question is, is it multilingual? And that depends entirely on your back end. So it is, Adhesion doesn't really care. It passes the string down to the text to speech engine. I don't know about Swift's capabilities for multilingual. Okay. Okay, so another example here is a call screening application. Um, now, I don't actually expect you to read all this, uh, and I'm going to zoom in on parts of it in just a second, but this is an actual production call screening app that I wrote for a client uh, several years ago. And what it does is when the, when the call is placed to the recipient, the recipient hears a little prompt saying, you have an incoming call, and it reads the phone number, and then gives them the option to press 1 to accept the call or 2 to hang up. Pretty standard call screening. Um, Okay, so let me zoom in on two parts of it. The first at the top, <coughs> there are two lines. The first one in the, is to trim a leading plus if a leading plus is in the caller ID. And the second is to trim a leading one because we don't really care about international prefix and if it's a US call, we don't want to read the one every time. So if you look at how that's done, at the very end we have a parentheses and a curly brace and a parentheses and a curly brace and a parentheses. And if you miscount by one, it's not going to work. And that's really hard to catch. 
those syntax errors, especially if you come back to it later and you try to unravel this line, it's really hard to see. The bottom is a simple counter that iterates over the string of digits, and it just reads the digit back one at a time. Again, that's, that to me feels like a lot of code just to read through a few digits. So here's the same thing except done with Ruby. At the very top, you see we grab the digits, and we use a simple single regular expression to pull out the plus and the one if they're present. And that's much, to me, that's, to my eyes, that's much more readable. In the next block, we create the list of prompts that will be called. And by the way, I'm comparing this to this, right? The full thing. So in the second block, we create the list of prompts that we're going to play. The first is you have a call from, then we take each digit in order and add it to the list, and then we add the, op, the prompt that says you know, press one to accept, press two to reject. At the, in the middle toward the bottom here, you have this input call. Input is a generic way of asking for input, keypad input from the user, from the caller. So we play the list, list of prompts. You see we just pass the entire array into the playlist. We have a five second timeout, and we save it, the result as result. And then we can use a case statement at the bottom to say if one was pressed, then we're gonna set the channel variable go sub result to screen accepted. Uh, otherwise, no, this is a simple example. If you wanted to handle two separately, you could simply add another line for two, another line for three. But in this case, anything other than one sets the go sub result to continue. So again, to me, this is much, much easier to read. So I have three other examples I wanna show you that why I think adhesion is a power tool. The first is using AMI to interrupt blocking calls. I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, the next is dynamically changing asterisks configuration. And the third is the adhesion console. So I'll start with interrupting blocking operations. I'm gonna set up this scenario here for you. Your caller wants to place a call through your system, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna get the call in and then send it off to a destination. Think something like a calling card operation. The way to do that would be the dial application. That makes sense. But the caller also wants to be able to enter pound pound to escape out of that uh, and to, to come back and continue processing. So you, wanna, you only wanna hang up the far end channel. You don't wanna hang up the inbound caller. Because uh, the caller wants to do something after the call completes. The problem is that dial is blocking. So I'm going to show you how we do that in adhesion. So I have an asterisk app, or I have an asterisk instance up and running here. And I'm going to start my adhesion app in this window. So first I'm just gonna show you that it works, I hope. Okay, so to, the way I've simulated this is I've set up a dial called music, and the only thing it does is I, it will call into asterisk and then immediately dial back out to a channel that just goes to music on hold. The point is to simulate a call that just keeps running and going and going. Well, I didn't do audio. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so we got music on hold. Now if I press pound twice, with a, with a base dial application, nothing will happen, but I've got something here that's watching. In this window, you can see, I've got something that's watching for the key presses. When I press pound twice, it should end the call and, t and tell me to goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, so it worked. Let me show you how it worked. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this code because it's a little bit um, verbose, but what I have here is at the top, this is a method that looks for an asterisk manager interface called uh, event called new channel. So every time a new channel is established in asterisk, it's going to look for a channel variable set called master channel. Now that's used to associate the, the outbound leg with the inbound leg. I'll show you how that master channel gets set in just a second. So the whole purpose of this, this method at the top is just to associate the two channels because they're still separate channels in the asterisk instance. This bottom one handles the DTMF. So each time you get a key press in asterisk, you'll get a corresponding asterisk manager interface event. Now that event carries lots of information. It carries the channel that sent it. It carries whether the DTMF is inbound, that's a received event, or whether it's outbound. So for every DTMF in this case, we'll get two. We'll actually get four, but we'll get two. We'll get one on the receive side for the inbound channel, and then one on the send side for the outbound channel. You'll also get an event each time the DTMF starts and stops, although I think that's asterisk one, eight, and later could be wrong about previous versions. Um, 
the, so that's actually and that's an interesting point because the, uh, the, start, the difference in time and timing between the start and stop events is also how I control the helicopter. It determines how long the button was held down. But since all we really care about is that the button was pressed, I only want to see where the digit was pound, so I don't care about any other key. I want to see where the direction was received, because I only care about the ones coming into the asterisk, not the ones we're sending out. And I want to see where the header yes, or header end is yes. So this is only catching the end DTMF events. So it goes through here and it looks up, uh, to, it looks up to find the two channels that are correlated based on which, which one got the event. And then it sends an asterisk manager hang up, manager send action hang up on the channel, on the sub channel, so on the outbound leg. And when that happens, the call falls through. So I'll show you what that looks like in the dial plan. Looking at this block right here. Uh, the very first thing we do is answer. And this, this is what happens when the call came in. We answered it. We set the variable master channel. And if you're familiar with asterisk, that leading underscore is, is, a, is, a, is a trick in asterisk variables that tells it to persist that variable on all subchannels. So when the second call, the outbound leg is set up, that master channel variable will be set on the outbound leg. And we use that to correlate the two. And then we just dial. In this case, we dialed localhost. And then dial blocked. Right? Nothing else happened until I interrupted. I hung up the far leg. And then we fell through and you heard it say goodbye. So that's the first example of something that is not easy to do uh, with traditional tools, but is very relatively easy to do when you have a combination of both AGI and AMI in the same process. OK, so the next one I want to show you is how to make a runtime configuration change in Asterisk. How many of you here in here realize that you could actually change Asterisk's on-disk configuration using the manager interface? <coughs> OK, a few people knew. So this is a pretty cool trick. Um, we had a client come and talk to us and ask us to create uh, a, a very simple conference line where um, your callers will call in and they will specify a conference room. Any conference room, doesn't matter. The, f the first person to specify the number will create the conference, create the configuration. So it's really a, it's a kind of a public access system. Um, but the first caller also will be able to set a pin so that future callers will only be able to enter the conference if they know the conference room and the pin. So it's sort of a self-driven conferencing system. More importantly, the room needs to persist even after everybody leaves. So I can't just really use a dynamic conference here. I actually want to put it into disk and persist across reloads of asterisk. Uh, and the web user interface was not an option here. It had to be done through the phone. So the way we did this in Adhesion was this little block called what I call Dynacomp. Really snazzy name. Um, OK, so the first line that we get is we call input, which is the catching input from the DTMF. Uh, we're only going to collect five digits. We're going to play this uh, into your conference room, give them five seconds, and allow them to press pound to terminate the input. Now, the pound is not actually returned in the, in the input. If we detect a pound, we disregard it. If we hit to five seconds, we just return whatever we get. Um, so again, you don't have to trim any strings. It just all happens automatically for you. Uh, all right, so the next thing we'll do is we'll send an action to asterisk that says get config. So it's actually going to load in this meetme.com. And it's going to look at, we only want the room list back. So we're getting a list of rooms that are already configured in the system. This block of code here converts the uh, raw headers coming back from asterisk into a Ruby array. So I have a very convenient list of all the rooms already configured. So if the room does not already exist, then I want to prompt for a pin. So we do that here. We collect a three-digit pin. And then uh, again, with a timeout of five. And if they don't provide a pin, we hang up. because we, This is going to require a pin. So this is, this is kind of the magic part right here. Once we've collected the room number and the pin, we'll send this update config manager action to asterisk and tell it to update meetme.com. We're going to tell it the room that we collected and the pin, and it'll stick this into the meetme configuration file. And at the same time, reload app meetme so it gets all that information on the fly. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that this works, but I have to caveat that I'm running this on a Mac, and I don't have Dottie installed, so the meet me part won't actually work. But the config change will. So first, let me show you. We have a very, very empty looking meetme.com, just general in rooms, right? So I'm going to go into my soft phone here and dial the conference. Please enter your conference number followed by the pound key. Does anyone have a favorite number? Three, two, three, five. All right. 
Please enter the conference PIN number. I'm just going to make the PIN 222. All right, now it hung up because I couldn't join the Meet Me Bridge. But if I take a look at the config file again, the config line has been added. Now this is an example just for meetme.conf, but this works with any asterisk config file. So if you want to add, not that I'm recommending this, but if you want to add SIP peers on the fly or update logging statements, all these things work just by sending the manager statements to asterisk. And it's persistent, right? So if, if asterisk crashes or the system gets rebooted or something, it'll all come back when the system does come back up. So the question is, why did I write two files instead of using real time? Um, in this case, the server in question wasn't using real time, and they didn't want to configure real time because it wasn't. We were using um, the system itself had no database. All of the validations for the rest of the application were done using web web calls. And keep in mind that I didn't actually write to a file. I told Asterisk to write to a file. So uh, the adhesion process could be running elsewhere. This is Asterisk managing its own configuration files. No, no, Adhesion did not write to the file. Adhesion told out, so Adhesion could be running elsewhere. Yeah, Asterisk could have written to a database or ODBC or ASTDB or any of, there, there are a thousand ways to skin this cat. This was the requirement of this client. I'm not saying this is the best example of this, but the ideas are cool, and there are possibilities here that you may not have thought of. All right, so the last thing I want to show you is the adhesion console. Um, if it, has anyone here actually worked with Rails at all? No, not one? Okay. So Rails has this really cool idea called the Rails console, and what it does is it boots up the web environment but gives you an interactive console where you have access to your entire application environment. So you can do things like look at the database, you can um, execute methods. It's, it's a really, really handy tool for debugging. So we took that idea and we brought it to asterisk with adhesion. So to do that, I'm going to start adhesion with the console argument. Let me make that bigger. Okay, now for the purpose of this demo, I've got just a simple little loop here. If someone dials the console address, what will happen is the call will go into this infinite loop, it'll play beep and it'll wait a second, it'll play beep and it'll wait a second. Um, okay, so let's place that call. All right, so you can see it working. Now, what I want to do is I actually want to take control of this call and interact with it just as if I were the application. So I'm going to say use, and I'm going to grab a handle on the call. But you can't actually see what I'm doing, but I'll, I'll show you what I did that in a second. So what has happened is I've actually stepped into the middle of the application, into the middle of my code, and I now have access to the call over AGI itself. So, for example, let's say I wanted to play a sound file. Everybody's favorite, TT Weasels. Weasels have eaten our phone system. Right, so I can do everything in the application I can do here in this console. So if I wanted to collect input from the, from the caller, and let's say I want two digits, and we're going to play the file um, beep, just because it's a handy prompt. So, it played beep and it's waiting for me to enter something, so I'm going to enter a 3-3. Three, three. And you can see there here, input has returned 3-3. Three, three. This is really, really handy for debugging. Whether you're trying to figure out something with asterisk, we used it quite a bit to troubleshoot text-to-speech uh, pronunci pronunciation issues. We could just paste in text-to-speech strings and modify them in real time and get immediate results. It's really handy for that. The other thing is you, it's really handy for testing your own application. You can, use, you can invoke your own libraries, your own method calls, and see the results in real time based on what's coming back from the call. So this is, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump back up to that one second. Let me turn off the logger so we can actually see what we're doing here. I can't see. All right, um, do this. Okay, so what I did is I called logger.silence, which just gets rid of all logging. Um, so the command, I'm gonna mute this so you don't have to listen to that, is use, and then it's a, it's a call ID. So in this case, I only have one call in the system. It's, um, where is it? It's, it's sip slash blink, right? So if I know the channel ID, I can just say use and then the channel ID like that. 
In this case, though, I also have a list of all of the calls in the system. So if I call, so that, there's a list of calls. It's an array. There's only one, but it's showing you. Um, so I, what I did in this case to make it easy, I just said use calls to A, which converts it to an array, and I just grabbed the first one. So that grabs the first call in the list of active calls in the system. Um, yeah, so the question is, am I querying the state of asterisk to get the list of calls? This refers to the list of calls connected to adhesion. It does not consider calls that are not connected to the AGI socket. Yeah. You can't really interact with them anyway because you don't have control of it. So this list only shows me the ones I can actually interact with. Um, so this is something that we, we introduced around uh, July of this year and has been just really, really helpful for debugging. So let me go uh, back to the slide here. So those are the power tools that I like to use, um, but there's, there's a lot more to it. I would invite you to check out our website, adhesion.com. Um, we have a lot of documentation. We have getting started. We have a really, really fantastic community. If you have any questions, please ask on our mailing list or our, 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 our IRC channel. And of course, please feel free to email me directly. Uh, we have Twitter and email and all that stuff. So.